going forward with these graphs using the ERA the same way. And uh, we, as a legislature, are required to balance the budget um, constitutionally. Um, and we have been using the CBR um, to fill the deficit. And since that is being depleted, we are now considering using the um, the ERA to balance the budget. And the most telling graph I think the public should look at is number f uh, slide number five, which is the the permanent fund decline in value. Uh, while we are, um, if we do not have a POMV payout, uh, we could see the permanent fund um, lose value of close to $15 billion by 2027, and that is uh, an astonishing number. The Senate has passed the, the POMV plan twice, knowing that uh, uh, without a POMV plan, uh, the permanent fund is, um, will continue to lose value, and when you have the permanent fund losing value, uh, that also reflects on the amount available for the dividend. Um, and we have included uh, increases um, in the dividend in, sen in the Senate's version of Senate Bill 26. But the problem that I see is when you're looking at the previous slide, we have uh, impacts over the next eight years of close to a billion dollars in differences uh, on top of the, uh, um, the $2.8 billion that uh, uh, Director Teal had mentioned. So we, not only are we facing um, major reductions in the fund itself, we are also um, having a problem addressing how we fill the deficit. And uh, that is uh, why we are looking at structural changes to the, uh, to the way the, the fund is used, but that in and of itself is not enough to, uh, to turn the tides on, on our operating budget, which we are, we are constitutionally required to balance. And uh, that is why I think that the governor has come forward with uh, uh, the uh, the revenue measure that he has uh, he has presented to us, people are saying that um, when you look at uh, FY 27 or 26, the tide turns. The problem is how do we get to 2026 when the tide turns, and that is the the battle that we are having. We have uh, on this page. Um, notwithstanding the $2.8 billion that uh, uh, Director Teal had said that the deficit is, that we're starting with, we have another uh, close to a billion dollars that, uh, that is before us in the recalculation. And uh, that is the problem that we are facing and uh, the public should understand. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Director Teal, do you have a comment on that? Uh, Senator Machiki. Actually, mine is about the permanent fund dividends on this slide. I see you have the dividend override on, and it doesn't seem like this model is paying out a dividend. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, Senator Machiki, no. It's, uh, important point. It assumes that dividends continue to be paid according to the statutory formula, and of course, that's one of the problems with this scenario, is that because of the high dividends, uh, the, well, the high dividends contribute to the deficit, which causes you to draw. It's a combination of the deficit and the high dividends that cause the permanent fund value to decline. So this is not assuming no dividends, it's assuming status quo dividends of 2200 and rising up to $3,000 per year. It's, to Senator Hoffman's comment, I think it's important to note that, that 
this is just a different way of saying what he said, is that when the earnings reserve is gone, which it looks like will happen by 2028, then dividends and or government expenditures, or the government payout, however you want to say that, they're not going to get the money that they've been accustomed to. The money doesn't exist. Dividends either have to vanish or go way down because there simply isn't enough money in the earnings reserve account to pay dividends and fill the deficit. So something breaks badly beginning in about 2028. Again, uh, for those that are following online, this is a snapshot in time with a specific set of criteria. I asked uh, my staff to pull the average earnings for the permanent fund because it's a huge criteria piece that's on this static snapshot. So since its inception, the permanent fund uh, has grown by 8.78%, and we have a new actuary supported uh, 6.5. That might not be the specific Mr. Teal that they asked for, but that's how the board responded uh, to interactions with the actuaries on behalf of the people of Alaska and dropped their, uh, their earnings assumption down to the 6.5 ounce to the 6.95, I think is what you said was in earlier. <clears throat> Uh, it, would be no it should be noted that for the last five years, the average earnings on uh, the permanent fund, both the corpus and the earnings reserve, is at 8.94%, so again, significantly higher uh, than is being reflected here, but also should be noted for the last three years, it's been at 618 which is lower as far as the short tracking mechanism. So this is a huge swing, as Mr. Teal said earlier, a half a percent could mean $300 million based on uh, you know, $60 billion worth of investments. And so these are huge fluctuations that your legislators are having to consider as we look at the health of the uh, earnings reserve account and access uh, to uh, a sustainable draw or an unplanned draw. And an unplanned draw is uh, from my opinion, one of the worst case scenarios that we could face. And we did have Ms. Rodell in front of us. Uh, we also saw something in the media talking about what unplanned draws might do in the future uh, as far as the uh, investment board making decisions based on trying to react or be uh, proactive to what the legislature might do. So if uh, Alaskans have questions, please contact your legislator and uh, follow along in this conversation because there are many knobs on this fixed slide uh, that can change both to benefit Alaskans and both to um, increase the challenges that we face uh, in our operating budget specifically. Mr. Teal, are there other questions or comments from uh, members of Senate Finance? Senator Bishop. Just a comment, I'm glad you, you made your previous comments for those that might be dialing in late. This page five is, as David said, the status quo, no plan, you know, that you could be dialing in and it sounds like a George Orwell War of the Worlds conversation here on the radio. We, we, we do have a plan, we're just gonna figure out how we're gonna get to the plan, so um, thank you. So noted, uh, Senator Bishop, uh, the Senate certainly has proposed one set of ideas to close the gap and the other body uh, has proposed another set of ideas and hence trying to come together for the people of Alaska to do what is best. Mr. Teal. Okay. Um, I'd like to maybe step back a little bit. There are some new members on, on the Finance Committee and, and legislators in the room and even for those of you that have seen this model before, it's been a while and it might help to, to just quickly review some of the assumptions that are in here. Um, on expenditures, you have two lines. The dark line is the OMB 10-year expenditure plan um, with dividends, and the dotted line is without. So um, 
the holes that we've talked about before, I think Pat Pitney, director of OMB, was here in front of you and talked a little bit about the holes in 19. Those are filled in the OMB 10-year expenditure plan. So um, they're already built in, no corrections necessary. So we are using the OMB 10-year plan, except that as Director Pitney noted, they did not have a number in there for supplementals. So what this dotted line is showing is the OMB plan plus $50 million a year for supplemental appropriations. We put that number in there. It's an arbitrary number. It's intended to be the unanticipated costs of fire suppression, uh, other programs. It's, I think, a reasonable guess at a, a consistent level of supplementals, but that's subject to your change. As you know, you can change many of the assumptions in the model. That's one of them. Mr. Thiel, if we're trying to uh, place the most conservative estimate so that we have a wider bandwidth to look at, is there an average then for fiscal notes that have been uh, normally attached to a 10-year OMB plan that we're not considering now? I mean, should we actually add more money onto this uh, particular scenario when we always pass bills, or at least in the past there's been bills passed, they usually carry fiscal notes. It seems we're starting to anticipate things that uh, haven't realized themselves now, and so we're putting more variables into our considerations than we ever have in the past, at least. Uh, Madam Chair, that's always a problem when you try to run a model, and that's why we go to the Department of Revenue for the revenue projections. We do it because we, they're best at it. Um, it's why we turn to the permanent fund for their earnings projections. You may disagree with 6.5 instead of 6.95, but we're going to use the permanent fund fund projections because they're the ones who are investing the money and we just say if that's what you tell us that's going to be our base case. The same is true of expenditures. Um, what you see on this line is, is that the expenditure plan is, is designed to maintain the FY18 level of service and therefore it grows at 2.25 percent with inflation. You may disagree with that. You may say the legislature wants to bend that expenditure curve downward. You can do that in a scenario. We just use these things for the base case. Similarly with supplementals, it might be 50, it might be 100 with fiscal notes. Sometimes they're negative. The sum of the fiscal notes is negative. Sometimes they're very large. There's no real way to, to put in a, a number and say uh, we all agree on that one because I, I don't know that you can. We just try to use the best numbers we have available to us from various sources and then try to fill in very few things. We have not built in fiscal notes. We did build in supplementals. That might not be enough money and we might not be conservative enough on the expenditures. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and that's exactly what the Senate has requested. Uh, 